Hey, everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. Well, today is day six of Longevity Week on Chef AJ Live. We have been meeting fascinating, fabulous guests all week that are long-term vegans in their 50s, 60s, 70s, and now over the weekend in their 80s that are absolutely thriving and living their best life, look and feel great. And we're going to find out what some of their secrets are. Today, we have Mimi Kirk, who is going to talk about what it's like to be 84. But she's only been 84 for a day. So I don't know how much she's going to be able to share because her birthday was yesterday. Happy birthday to Mimi and welcome to the show. It's so nice to see you. Nice to see you. Thank you for having me on. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, you have got, I mean, you, I, I thought I was the, the vegan OG, you know, 45 years, but you've got me beat, Mimi. You've been vegan pretty much your whole life. I thought you were only 45 years old. <laughs> 62. But I mean, I want to be you oh. when you grow up because it's not just that you look great, but you look like you're so happy and fulfilled and feel great. And you did this all without having to eat animal products. Exactly. I don't think people believe it because, as you know, when you are a vegan or even a vegetarian, people say, what do you do for protein? And I mean, that's the first thing people ask. And I'm, I've never been protein deficient. And I became a vegetarian and, and when I was 30. And it was really for the animals because yeah, I found out what happens to animals. And I thought, oh, my God, I've been eating meat. I grew up with it. I just can't do that anymore. And it took me a while to understand vegan because... That means no wearing leather. You still want to do everything you can to not put the animals into any stress. And so then you go vegan after vegetarian because you decide you don't want to do anything and don't take things from an animal and, you know, don't wear leather and stuff like that. And then a couple of times uh, during that time, I was 30, a couple of times throughout that period, I would go off for just a short period of time and go, no, no, I've got to go back on. I never really thought about health early on. I just thought about it was for the animals. Little did I know that I could be this healthy at 84. And it's not my family genes or history at all. They don't have a good health history. So I know that it's the way I've eaten. And of course, because of that, I think differently. You know, I, I feel like in this lifetime, we have to be kind to all living things. And I think that makes you feel inside a little happier. That could be part of my happiness. And also that I'm so healthy at this age. Honestly, I could say I was 48 instead of 84. Yeah. <laughs> so I, you know. I know it's funny because, you know, I, you know, there's a saying you're as old as you feel. And, I, I, you know, sometimes I'm like, how am I 62? Like, I, I, I don't feel like I'm in my, I don't know what that's supposed to feel like, but I bet you feel as good today as you have your whole life. I do. What I, what I've realized, this is something I realized recently, my body's aging. It does. You get wrinkles you know, your body doesn't hold up the same way physically. You don't look the same in some way. I mean, I've kept my weight off, but you know, there's gravity that happened. My, I am not my body. I am something else. And I really can feel I am something else. And I feel timeless because of that, because the body's going to age. And I'm not worried about that. I really, you know, I've got lines, I've got wrinkles, things are happening, you know, everything drops a little bit, but so what? I look in the mirror. That's not, I, I can see it's a body and it looks great. It looks fine, but it's, I don't feel like that's who I am. So I have now have, have in this age bracket now feel really very timeless. And I think that's just an amazing feeling to have that. But I think when you're healthy, you can do that. If you're not healthy, you're dealing with your health throughout your, after your, you know, get older, a lot of things can happen and you're dealing with health issues. So if you can start at any time to be healthy, but the earlier you start, I promise you, it will make a difference. It will make a difference if you start taking better care of yourself, eating right. Listen, we all know what we should eat and not eat. Anyone who says, what should I eat? We all know you cannot eat donuts. You're not eating certain things all the time. I'm, I'm a proponent of, hey, you have to live and sometimes you do something, but it's not what you do sometimes, it's what you do most of the time that counts. So you don't have to torture yourself or, or, or feel like you can't have everything. You can have everything, but you need to put your health first. And I think that because without that, as you age without your health, it's not as easy. So I really feel like my life is easier and happier and I can do anything. I feel young. I started new careers. You know, you can do anything if you're healthy. And I think it's number one. You got to put yourself number one. 
Now, at the, speaking of new careers, you have had your fingers in a lot of pies. <laughs> I have. I think that I can only do something if I'm passionate about it. And then I've done it. I've accomplished it. And then I, something else comes into my mind and I think, oh, I'm going to try that. Or just most recently, I mean, my whole history has been that way. I was widowed at 29. I have four children. And I was a stay-at-home mom and a single mom for many years. And I had to find a job. So I tried to get a job in the film industry since I lived in California and Hollywood, actually, L.A. And um, I was able to get in as an extra, you know, walking in the background. And then through that, somebody thought at the time, I did really look like Mary Tyler Moore. You see old photos of me with the dark hair flip and all of that. And then someone said, hey, she's just starting a new show, the producer, and, and she's looking for as an assistant and somebody can stand in for her. So bango, there I was. And then I started designing clothes for Rhoda, for Valerie Harper, for that character. Because she wanted to dress like I did, which was very boho chic, you know, that kind of hippie thing. And uh, then I started making scarves for her and dressing her like I dressed. And then I had to stop dressing that way because people think I copied her. They didn't know that I had designed her clothes. <laughs> So, you know, there was part of my career to support my family. And since then, I've been in many other careers and had businesses and sold them, started something and sold it. And the most recent, I could go on with all my terrific life. I've been very lucky. Uh, my most recent is that during COVID, I started making uh, sourdough bread because everyone said it's a challenge. So I thought, OK, I'm home all day. So I was making sourdough bread and giving loaves out to everybody. And then I got that perfected. Honestly, I can make it with my eyes closed and it's awesome. And then I thought, oh, maybe I should paint. Well, I only painted before a little bit, but never anything. I don't paint trees or, so I just never thought I could paint. I got some paints in a brush. My boyfriend took me down to the art store and I started painting. And my grandkids said, oh my God, grandma, you could paint. I'm putting up a Instagram account for you. So I had, 15 paintings I put up and I sold 11 of them. So then I realized I could paint. So now I have been painting for over a year and selling my works and doing a lot of commissions. And it's kind of my new excitement, waking up every day with something I'm excited to do, which I think is another important yeah. thing. That's, in, that's important because one of the things I, I, I'm learning from all the wonderful guests this week is they're all engaged in life because I, yeah. I've always said this because I used to work in retirement homes before I became a chef 20 years ago. And it, it just seems like when you retire, you expire. Exactly. That's well, it's the media that kind of says that we're not as valuable. We don't have that much to offer. And listen, I love young people. I love being around young people. I think it's great. I learn a lot. And I just love it, bright, sharp, whatever. My grandkids are just awesome. But I really do think that if you stay engaged, nothing, nothing changes, just if your life was like that. So you have to find what it is you love to do. And a lot of people, when I coach people, they say, oh, well, I don't know. I, I don't know my passion is, I don't know what I love to do. Well, that's the first thing you have to figure out. And I think it comes from a decision to love yourself just the way you are accept yourself in your aging and accept yourself the way you are. And how would you treat someone you love? You want to do the best for them. So this is what you do for yourself. This is someone I love. What would I advise them? Find something you love to do. I don't know what it is for you. Do you like to give parties? Do you like to take people to the movies? Do you like to see architecture? Do you like to draw or paint or cook or whatever? Find something that makes you happy when you're doing it because when I'm painting, and it's the same when I'm cooking, making foods, I'm nowhere else. I am so in the moment of that. I'm not thinking about anything else. I'm not doing anything else. I'm totally in the moment of what I'm doing. I can't think about anything else. That I think is really healthy when you absolutely are in the moment and then your creativity comes out. So if you've ever wanted to do anything, I think you can learn almost anything you can take lessons, you can go online and watch YouTube videos, you can learn anything, why not? So if you have an interest, don't think you're too old to do it or too young to do it, just figure out what it is. So that's kind of my thoughts on your passion and, and how to find things you love to do. Yeah. What, what was Mary Tyler Moore and, and uh, Valerie Harper like? Amazing women, because as you, if you can remember back at that time, there weren't many women that weren't housewives on TV. 
These were women who were working uh, in, as a new in a newsroom and as a window decorator, and they were you know more getting more glorified. Women were wanting to follow both of those women, whoever they. Um, you know, you always pick somebody out in a movie that you can relate to. So some people related to Mary and some people related to Valerie. And they were uh, really popular on the covers of everything. I mean, it was really awesome to see. And they had women writers on the set, which not wasn't happening at the time. They had a lot of women writers for both those shows. So it was an exciting time and an amazing cast. Everybody it was like a big family. And I worked for Mary for years. And then when Valerie got her own show, we were very close and she said, can I have her because she's doing my wardrobe and everything else. So I moved over with Valerie, but both these women were icons and uh, legends really. And still those shows are amazing. And oh beautiful. my God. Yeah, my favorite. I mean, you, you can watch uh, the Mary Tyler Moore show over and over. Over and over. Yeah. And, the, and those women were just iconic for that time really because you saw most of those women, they were little housewives with their kids and they had their little dresses on and they were, you know, being a housewife, which nothing is wrong with that. That's a hard work. It really is. But it was all that I was ever told that you either get married or you work as a secretary and you should be a wife and have kids and take care of your husband. That's in my day, even the school teacher in homemaking told us that you have to give in 90 percent of the time and help your husband. And that's what I learned in the 50s going to school, early 50s. And when this show came out, it was the 70s and things had changed. And now, of course, they're even better. We're all, we can do what we want. If you love being home, that's a great thing to do because there's so much to do and so much to learn from being there. I think it's great to be with your kids while they're growing up. That's a great thing. I did not want to go to work, but I had to. I was forced into it after my husband's death, but I would have loved to have been with them longer. But they're also amazing. Whatever I did, I am so proud of myself because I have the most awesome kids, loving, fabulous, independent, creative, just the best kids. And same thing with my grandkids. I am really lucky to have such a close knit, loving family. And uh, I wanted to, I want to say that it had a lot to do with the things I believed in that I was able to pass on to them about being um, kind to everybody and being kind to yourself, loving yourself and doing what you love. I didn't say you have to go to college, you have to do this, you have to do that. Just have a good time and do the things you love. And I, I recommend that to anybody, even at any age, do what you love. And yeah. if it's a job that you have to work at, it doesn't stop you from studying new things online. Thank goodness for the internet that you can find anything you want. You wanna learn how to sing, you wanna learn how to, you know, play piano. You can do all of that online. So even if you have a job you don't like, don't stop yourself. Do the things you love. Wow. You know, it, it's so true, Mimi, because even if you're eating the perfect diet and exercising and sleeping right, if you're miserable because you hate what you do, that's not going to lead to optimal health. No, it's not. And if you if you don't allow yourself to, um, my kids call it that I'm in denial. I like to look at things on the positive side. I know what's going on. I know what's happening in the world. I have complete compassion for everything, but you can't live in the dark like that all the time. You have to bring your light energy because I think the more of us who do that, energy is all over. We can change things by having the right kind of energy and bringing that just in our circle of friends when we shop at the market, when someone's waiting at us in a restaurant or whatever. If we can bring light to somebody, we're doing a really good human job out there. And I think that that's very, really important to do that, especially in the hard times we're having now. It is really difficult for so many people right now. And uh, you just have to do your best to hold yourself up and, and try to bring every, everybody else up the best you can that you are in touch with on a daily basis. It's like you have to be local to what you're doing. We can't solve everything, but we can take action local and in our daily life, I think is really important. Kind of like keep, keep our own side of the street clean. Right, exactly. Yeah. That's a good thing. Yeah, you know, I, I'm, I'm curious uh, because you've been vegan for pretty much your whole life. When you worked in television, you know, I, I think about craft services. It's not always the healthiest wow. food. Were you having to bring your own food? And did people notice, did it ever come up with, with Mary or Valerie the way you eat? Well, I'm glad you asked that because this is so interesting. When I first started on The Mary Show, Craft Service had 
what they always have. Donuts for breakfast, snacks that are unhealthy, chips and all of that for later in the day. And I said to Mary, is there any way that we can have craft service bring fruits in or a vegetable platter? And honestly, they tell Mary and Valerie both tell me that I started that trend in craft service in the early 70s when I st first started working for her because craft service started bringing that in. And then on the other sets, they started bringing that in. So I was, you know, vegetarian at the time, not quite vegan yet at, in the beginning of stages then. And they started, craft service started changing. And, you know, I mean, I think that Valerie and Mary, Valerie in her book mentions a lot of things that I did like that. And I think it's really amazing that women at that time we're supporting other women and being as generous to say, hey, this was her idea the way I'm dressed and this was her idea for craft service. And, you know, Valerie gave me a lot of credit in her book about these kinds of things, but no, that started it. And then, Val and then Mary had me go talk to her husband at the time about his diet. So, and I used to fix Mary's lunch every day in, in the trailer. She would go to her trailer and I'd go pick her up something or fix her lunch. And I always tried to feed her as healthy as possible. Uh, she had diabetes and right. you know, she, I, I remember she was type one if I remember correctly. Type one. Yeah. And uh, so she danced every day. She was very active and she ate healthy. And I was part of bringing in, you know, her lunch on a daily basis. So she wasn't vegetarian or vegan, but I made sure she had plenty of the vegetables and salads. Listen, I think um, it's fun. I don't like to uh, comment on what anyone eats or doesn't eat. It's up to them to decide. But I do feel unless you're eating enough vegetables and fruit, you're not getting true nutrients. Now people could say you need meat, but I haven't eaten it in years and I can't be, I'm totally healthy. No, never told my protein is bad or anything else, but, and I'm not the only one. There's a lot of us out there who still are in great shape from eating a plant-based diet, but you have to include enough. You have to have a juice in the morning. That gives you a huge amount of nutrients right off the bat in one juice, You've got spinach and cucumbers and it's pure. It's all um, ground up and, and strained basically if you have a good juicer, a slow juicer. And um, it, you know you can start out that way and then you can eat a big salad during the day. And then it's okay if you have something else and you eat a dinner and you want a, you know, a, a piece of fish or chicken or whatever you want and some vegetable. But if you don't get your nutrients, you're not gonna get them from processed food. You're not gonna get them from you know, gluten, Filled foods, you need to have fresh food. That your body knows what to do with that. It could process it. I mean, that's why the government always said well, five to six helpings of fruit and vegetables a day. And now it's like moved up to the top of the pyramid that you have to have that. So, you know, no matter what else you're eating, you have to have that. No matter what else you're feeding your dog, your dog needs it too. So, you know. Well, yeah. speaking of dogs, I don't know if yeah. you know, Mimi's written a lot of books and I actually just got this as a gift from Nan Simonson and it's just a wonderful, delightful book. It is great. I mean, first of all, the photos of those dogs to do a dog photo shoot like that. It was like awesome. We had a dog call at a park and everybody. Look at this it. one. I got to show yeah. this one. Look at this. Oh yeah. This so adorable. That wild, that, yeah. Paris is that dog's name. And we had the most amazing dogs and we put down our food, our recipes, and they gobbled it up so fast. We had someone in the kitchen keep making the food because the dogs were eating the food so fast. They loved it. Yeah. Look at and these guys. These dogs are what, just, I mean, you should buy the picture, the book just yeah, for this photo. Yeah. The, said, the food, and you, if you look at the food, you can see it's human grade food. It's like my, my boyfriend's the photographer on all my books. I've written seven and he's photographed all the books. And when we rewarded him after we did the dog book, every time he was finished shooting a picture, we let him eat the meal. So he was eating the dog food. I mean, there I would goes. eat this, this veggie no, you, regime. I would eat this recipe. So I think you need to add that. If you're set on saying that your dog needs meat, I can understand it. There's a lot out there about that. But I also know a lot of vegan dogs who are really healthy. Actually, in the book, we write about a woman who, whose dog is in the Guinness Book of Records. 25 years old, a vegan, and she had another dog that lived to be 18, and a, a strict vegan. And I have a lot of friends who will only feed vegan food to their dog. So you want to add some of this. Oh, the treats are amazing. Look at this sweet, you had sweet potato cheese. Sweet but potato. I gotta say, I, this photo cracks me up because I don't think I can get Bailey to drink a green smoothie. Oh, that's so funny. Yeah. Well, they were okay. they were licking everything. You know, I mean, even if you put a little in their water, 
you know, it's like there's all these tricks. We have little powders and dust that you can sprinkle on their food that has all this healthy food, but you can't just guess at this. You have to be sure. We would work with a food formulator and now there's more books coming out about the same thing, saying eating, giving your dog blueberries and microplaning some carrots on top of their food. So if you don't wanna cook, and this is very easy by the way, because you can make their food, fix the grains, add the fresh vegetables. You can keep it in the refrigerator for a couple of days and then you can bring it out and just have it very easy for them. It's not like you're you know, cooking a regular meal every single day. My daughter who I wrote the book with, she, she cooks for her dog. She makes her dog two meals a day and she, she cooks and has it all planned out. But I love the book. I think there's, even if you don't wanna feed your dog, um, plant food, you should read this dog and just get some information that I think is really valuable. So, yeah. yeah. Um, it's, some, it's a good book. It is a wonderful book. Jesse's asking in the, we have a chat feature, which you may or may not be able to see depending on how you're watching this. But she says, does anybody remember the Chuckles, the clown episode of Mary Tyler Moore? Oh, Do you yes. That famous episode? <laughs> yes. That was because, that ex-husband who played Chuckles. <laughs> because the reason I say that is one of the guests on the show was the director who won an Emmy for that episode, Joan Darling, who was my actor. No, right, right. Yeah. Yeah, Small world. They, they say six degrees of separation. And I know. I know. Well, you know, the, the, the actors on that show are not living anymore. And we just lost Betty White. She was kind of the last one. Oh, no. Um, not, none of them. None of them. No, none. The, some of Wait, the, what about John Amos, who played Gordy? The, the, I, maybe, maybe he is. Maybe John is still alive. Maybe I think John is still alive. But yeah. the regular cast, you know, the, not, not the guest stars. Right. Because there are a lot of guest stars that were on there that are still alive, but not all the, yeah. you know, but not all the regular players. Oh, my God. Like, Ted Knight was just hilarious. And, and, um, and, and Ed, Ed Asner and, you know, uh, yeah, everybody from that show was pretty amazing actors. And those are the ones who, and, and you know, That's Betty just passed away. She was the last of the people. Yeah. But oh. what did you ask? They sit around the table and do a, t a table reading before the show when it first when the scripts were done. And the d producers were just the most and writers were just the most awesome guys. And they uh, they would change things at the last minute. And then we'd shoot a live show on Friday night. And, you know, they come in during the day and then the cameras would come out at night to a live audience. And there would be three cameras shooting and uh, sometimes during a break. Um, the the, the writers would come down and say, oh, say this line instead. I don't know how they would change like that, that they could just do that, those actors. But it was pretty awesome that they were able to pick up the notes and change right on, right on the dime. But we were really close. We were together every day. I mean, that was, that's how that show was. We were together every day for all those years. And then, and then Valerie's show shot at the same studio. So it was a kind of continuation for me. And we were next to the New Heart stage and it was, it was a great time. It must it have been was, so much fun. It, wow. it was, I have you know, to say. Was, I know that Betty White was probably not vegan or even vegetarian, but she was a huge animal advocate. Did that ever come up? Yes, it was very funny because she was a huge, huge, but yet she ate, she ate animal. And people think she wasn't. They thought she was probably a vegan, but she wasn't. She ate what she wanted to eat and that was it, but she really took care of the animals. You know, a lot of times I find people don't, think about uh, uh, their pets and cows, you know? It's like, oh yeah, cow is to eat, but your dog is not to eat. And what's the difference really? I mean, pigs happen to be the smartest. They're like dogs. Pigs will understand. I have friends who have pigs. They, they understand just like a dog does. And people eat, that's a big thing. People eat pigs all the time. And they're as smart as a dog. So I, I don't know how people separate it, but they do. They think their pet is a uh, house pet is different than a farm animal or a wild animal or something, but they're all living things and they all have feelings. You can see the way elephants take care of their babies. You can see cows when they go to slaughter what's happening. I don't know. It's all the same, but you know, we have to choose what we want in life. I don't want to, you know, sit here and make people wrong for what they do. We all do what we do. We all try to do our best and that is all we can do and educate ourselves about everything, about animals, about politics, about life in general, about different cultures. I mean, you have to educate yourself. I, I think 
traveling is one of the most amazing things you can do because you're meeting people all over the world who don't speak your language, but you can find a way to, you know, a smile. <laughs> That's, that crosses every continent I've ever been on. You know, an energy that you portray to somebody when you're asking directions and trying to figure out where they're telling you to go, where you turn left or where you turn right. I just think that travel really broadens you. And I encourage my kids and grandkids to travel early and they all have. They've all been all around and meeting people in different countries. And, you know, one of my businesses was um, I invented a board game for women called Cowgirls Ride the Trail of Truth. And it was a board game for women to sit down at night, kind of a, uh, you know, a tequila margarita night uh, game. And it would be answering questions about your own life. And um, I sold that company. I think you can still find the game on Amazon or something. But I played it with women all over. Some women who were with somebody was translating it to them. We all want the same thing. A happy, healthy life. Good happiness for our family. People all over the world want that. And most people want all of that. I mean, there's always going to be the dark side of people. And there's no way we can convince that. But if you have a chance in life, you have to broaden yourself and get out of where you are in your little circle and meet other people who are different and meet people around the world who are different and find out the similarities, not the difference, but the similarities. And they're everywhere, even in politics, there's similarities in everything. And I think in this time, we need to look for that rather than the differences. I think we'd be a much happier, energetic world if we could just see the similarities we have. And um, yeah. Yeah, I, I know you're saying you don't want to make people feel bad for their food choices, but do you right. agree that we should at least make them aware? Because, for example, yes, you know, if, yes. We, if we if most people love their domesticated pets like dogs and cats, which in other countries are food and treated, right. differently, but if people did in this country to a dog or cat what is done every day to a chicken, a pig, or a cow, they would go to jail. Right, exactly. No, it is really important. And you know, there's some fabulous movies out. What's the one with Arnold Schwarzenegger? What is that Game one? Game Changers. Oh my God. I don't care who you are. If you haven't seen that, you have to watch that. That is really an amazing film. And I think it's turned a lot of people's heads, but there's a lot of that. Um, I know someone who um, was dating a veterinarian and the veterinarian was not a vegan. And she showed him that film and overnight, that was it. So I think that's one of the, there's so many. I mean, there's some that are a little hard to take. <laughs> if you can stomach them, you watch them, but you know, forks over knives. There's some that really appeal to just everybody. You might not want to be that a vegan or vegetarian, but look at those films, at least watch those films because you have to educate yourself about what's happening and then maybe when you see some of the stuff that's happening, you might not want to eat as much meat. Maybe you want to cut that. Remember how they started Meatless Mondays? You know, to think that someone on Monday would, would not eat meat? Well, eat less even. And anyway, I think it's good for your health. In, in the Blue Zone, if you haven't heard of the Blue Zone, it's a, a book that's out. It's a guy from, who went around from National Geographic to all these countries where people live to be over 100. And there were very big similarities in all of them. Most of them didn't even like meat or fish, but they grew a lot of their own food. They lived to be over hundred in, 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 in Sardinia, in Japan, and you know, different places in Greece and different places around the world where somehow a lot of people live to be over hundred. And they told about what they do. You know, in Sardinia, they drink a wine called Cananu and they drink two small glasses, not the big glasses we drink a wine, but two small glasses a day while they're out walking and visiting their friends. And they live to men are living to be over 100. And they eat mostly a plant-based diet. They don't eat until they're full. They eat smaller amounts. They eat, they say, until they're 80% full. You have to learn what that is. Don't eat everything on your plate. Know when you're actually full. Because it takes 20, 15 to 20 minutes for you to feel what you ate just ate. So slow down a little bit and let your food digest so it lets you know when to stop. But they all have pretty much the same thing. They're social, they have their church, they have family members, uh, they, they walk a lot, they tend to their own gardens, they're, they're active, they live to be over 100. So I think living this kind of lifestyle for ourselves, even in a city, 
where we might have more stress or anything else, we can still find a way to live our best, healthiest life. And uh, it would be fun to live 100 or over. I think that would be fun as long as you're feeling good. So well, I'll have you back on. <laughs> okay, good. I told my family that I don't want to hear like I passed away or I died. I want you to tell people I went to Italy and you don't know when I'm coming back. That's my new thing. That's where I'm going when I decide to not be here anymore. But I told them not, they're not to say I died or left because that's it. I went to Italy. So I don't know where you want to go. I have a friend who wants to go to the Rose Garden. And now my sister wants to go to the ocean. So now instead of saying that when you die, you can say where you want to go. How about that? That sounds much better, doesn't it? If I say I'm, I'm going to Italy, I don't know why that just sounds so much better. Yeah. That's what I like is when I go to Italy, I'm going to give you this painting. You know, when I go to Italy, you're going to get that ring. You know, So that's the way I can say it so I can, you know, enjoy it because I'm not worried about the end. I'm trying to be here in the moment, of course, but, you know, it all goes, we all go at some point. So I decided to look at it in a very light, a light way. I want to go wherever all my dogs have gone, wherever oh, they are. That's where I want to go. Wherever they are. That's so good. I so like that. If, it's, if all dogs go to heaven, that's where I want to go. You oh, know, the really blue good. zones and they do drink alcohol. And I'm curious, is that part of your diet? No, not really. But uh, I'm, I've never been much of a drinker. I don't think there's anything wrong with drinking wine. Maybe alcohol is not as good. But, you know, people really enjoy it. People like to sit down and have a glass of wine with dinner. I really think that's fine. I think you can't overdo it. I wouldn't say, no, you should never drink again because these guys in Sardinia are drinking red wine. And, you know, there's two sides to everything. And, you know, some people are drinking red wine and they're saying, you know, they live a long life and it's good for you, good for your heart and everything. The only thing I actually like on occasion, a rare occasion, my family knows they laugh, I'll have a little shot of sipping tequila. And that, that is the only thing I really enjoy. And I, the other night I was with my son, uh, he came in and celebrated my birthday earlier and I had a little red wine with him, but no, I don't drink very much. It's not, I don't miss it, but if you do like it, just, you, you can have a glass, but don't save it and drink it all on Saturday night. That's not good. You can't overdo anything. You can have, I eat chocolate almost every day, but I eat a small piece of chocolate full of antioxidants, dark chocolate. I think it's healthy. It works for me. So I think you should have what you want. I'm not a coffee drinker, but occasionally I will have a coffee. When I'm in Italy, I always drink a little shot of coffee or something. But I, I just think you have to be, you know, you have to be, you have to mind what you're doing and not overdo anything. But don't think you can't ever have anything again. I mean, you need a slice of cake, go ahead. Just don't do it tomorrow. <laughs> right. But some people, fun. there are some people that they can't seem to moderate certain items so they yes. just have to do it themselves i mean okay. for 10 for 12 years i think it's been i was a raw vegan and believe me i wouldn't eat get near anything that had anything else near it it was like no raw that's it and i all when i go out you know there weren't many places at the time now there's a lot of raw restaurants but i'd have a salad take the chicken off put avocado on i mean i was so used to just not even looking at a menu and just ordering what vegetables do you have and you know, what raw vegetables can you serve me? And then for 12 years, and then I decided to eat some cooked food because I was traveling and I thought, okay, I'm going to have a little cooked food. And then that was fine. I had a little bit, and now I do eat cooked food, but mostly I try to eat raw foods and get my nutrients in, but it's okay. People go, oh my God, you're not a hundred percent raw. Well, who's a hundred percent anything? And why do you have to be a number? Why can't you just do your best to eat a certain way? So I would say if someone's asking me, I'm 85% raw, but I hate the percents that people say, what, I thought you were all raw. Well, I'm not all raw. I am all vegan, but I'm not all raw. And I think it's okay for me. You have to choose what you want. When I was all raw, I felt the same way. I didn't say to everybody, oh, you have to eat raw. It's the best way to eat. I just said, this is the way that's working for me. And I think when we do tell something, we have to say what works for us. It doesn't mean it works for everybody. And I, I really think that's the way to do it. If we want more people in the world to be a vegan, which those of us who are, we do want people to be that. We think it's a kinder way of living and so forth. You can't shove things down people's throat. You can't sit at dinner and make people wrong. 
you can't think that you're up here and they're not because you yeah. can't do that. I hope is- Linda Middlesworth is hearing this. She's she was on the show this week. She's 78. She owns V Dog, and that's exactly what she did to her family. And now they don't talk to her. Exactly. This is not a way to. I mean, some people are very militant. I can understand. You do not want animals. I can really understand it, but this is not the way to get people to move ahead. It is not the way to make them wrong. And people would say to me, how do you sit at a table when people are eating meat? Because it's not going in my stomach and I'm sorry they are. They know why I have chosen to eat this way, but I can't tell anybody else what to do. Hey, I am an example at 84 and in excellent health. And all I can say is I know it's not like my family. I'm much healthier. They're all, they were all on medications. I'm as healthy as could be. And that's all I can say. I think that I can inspire people by just living my life the way it's right for me. Like, even if I say I'm going to eat a cooked meal, I'm not looking for the people who follow me to get mad because I ate a cooked sweet potato or something. That's their prerogative. I'm just being me. And if I can encourage somebody to say, hey, I'm in my late 60s and I don't feel so good. You think if I eat like you, I'd be better off. I'd I say, yes, <laughs> I think you would be, but do your best. Start including more raw foods in your diet. You can't do it overnight for most people unless you're sick and then you should do it overnight. If you've got an illness, you should yeah. do it overnight and just go for it. Stop eating sugars and stop doing that. But if you're not and you want to correct your health in some other way, I think it's fine to just take your time. I mean, my books are very, my book, Raw Vitalize, all my books are really good. And uh, my juice book and everything. I'm very proud of those books. I think that I would call them evergreen because this is the way to eat fresh food. This is what, this is what's been in front of us at the market forever. A fresh, you know, red pepper, a sweet pepper. I mean, you could just bite into one of those and it's a meal, you know? So my books are all, I think, evergreen. I think there's not going to be any change in that raw food situation. Maybe a little way to twist the recipe or something, but I make my own cheeses. I mean, vegan cheese today, you can buy at the market, it's delicious. You don't have to make everything like you did. There are so many things you can find. You know, people are buying kale chips at the market now. You never could when I was first making them. And um, the cheeses, I have a great uh, YouTube video on cheese making, and it kind of shows all my cheeses, hard cheeses, cream, you know, softer cheeses, you know, cheeses that you put on top of a, uh, you know, zucchini pasta or something, cheese sauce. I mean, you, there's plenty of, you're not missing anything. <laughs> Being a vegan, you're not really missing out on anything. You're eating everything, pizzas, breads, everything. So I don't, I don't see where you're missing anything except cutting into flesh, which is not my favorite thought, you know. <laughs> but, you know, I, I realize uh, I've seen almost all the movies out there that are about this type of thing and they're wonderful and they're very, very educational. And, you know, we need, we can't make opinions about stuff until we try it ourselves. That's why I say, just give it a try. Try a couple of dishes. I cook for people all the time and I'll make them a, a vegan meal and they just think it's delicious. They don't feel like they missed anything. So yeah, yeah. Oh, I'd, I'd love to try your food. One of the live viewers is saying lead by example, attraction, not promotion. And there's so much infighting in the vegan movement, oil, no oil, salt, no yeah, salt, right. raw, you know, uh, low fat. And it's like, who cares? I mean, see, I like you say, if somebody has a, a, a is, is, is in poor health or is trying to lose weight, they may need a different version of a vegan diet. Right. But if, if, if they're happy with their health and their weight, I'm just happy that they're vegan. Exactly. I mean, if there is there's always two sides. You have to figure out what's right for you. I have a lot of people that say, oh, no, are you a no, no oil, a no carb vegan? Are you, well, I, I don't know. No, I use oil. I think my skin looks pretty good for my age. I think oil is important. I mean, I eat avocados, but I use olive oil and, you know, avocado oil and sesame oil. I use, I use you know, good oils, what I consider good oil. That works for me. Might not work for somebody else. And some heart doctors say you can have it. And some say you can't. It's a lot of mixed messages out there. So you have to be decide and stop being confused. Just pick one and try it. And if that doesn't work for you, 
switch to something else. Right. Right. Exactly. Because because some of the guests, Karen Calabrese, who was on, uses oil. Oh, I mean, she's gorgeous. gorgeous. She's. I mean, gorgeous. so you can't just like. You're, I, I I love. I just love your way of being. You know, I'm curious. You said you had four children, seven grandchildren. Do any of them eat like this? Yes, my one daughter Mew, who I wrote Raw Vitalize with, she's very she's very much like I am. She eats mostly like I do. She's raw. She was raw with me uh, the longest time, but now she eats some cooked food. She's a very busy mom. We wrote that book, Raw Vitalize. We wrote that book to help people who don't want to get a dehydrator and make everything, you know, takes a little longer. It's a good book for somebody, 21 day book, how to make some really great foods that you can take to work with you and everything. So she eats like I do. My other daughter eats pretty much like I do. She's not strict, but she's organic. And um, she's the one I wrote the dog book with. And she eats always organic. And she eats, make sure that she gets all her vegetables and she juices every day. And I would say she eats mostly vegan, but she will eat a piece of fish or something, but mostly vegan. My sons, on the other hand, my one son, they're both, they're all healthy. They juice and believe in eating enough vegetables, but the boys are not vegans, but they, they eat mostly vegetables and juice and stuff like that and i'm fine with that because they're healthy and the grandkids let me think no none of them are really that way they eat everything i mean i've got sushi eaters and you know whatever they're all go on their own path but whenever we get together and i fix raw foods and vegan foods guess what they eat it completely they love it so much grandma will you make that will you fix this for me can you make that and no, they eat it and I've given them recipes for vegan stuff. And so they make that they're, they're, they're doing really well. But like I say, I don't, I don't want to force anybody to do anything. Yeah, and my boyfriend who I've been with for 20 years, um, he's, he is, he eats the way I eat because he doesn't cook. <laughs> so he's stuck <laughs> with my food. Now, when he'll go out, sometimes he might have a little cheese and it won't bother him. He doesn't say, Oh, take that off. I don't want that. But no, he's that way. And we've been together 20 years and he's 20 years, my junior. Wow. And I met him when I was 64 and he was 45. Oh my God. You're a cougar. <laughs> I am. And he didn't know my age. And in those days, I even looked younger than my age and not so much now, but then I looked younger than my age and he didn't know for a while. And then he saw some press on me from my board game and stuff. And then he figured out how old I was. And then he said, okay, I know how old you are. And I said, no, you don't. He said, oh yeah, I know you're 64. And I went, oh my God. I said, well, what do you think? He said, too late. I'm in love with you. So oh, that's beautiful. Now, 20 years later, we're together. And he's that's just amazing. An amazing guy. He's an amazing guy. He took all the photos from my book. He helps me with everything. He oh. looks out for me. He's just a sweet, kind person. My kids love him. I, mean, I, I love that he eats like you. What did he always eat like you or no. did you influence his eating? No. When I met him, my mother always said the way to a man's heart is through his stomach. So when I met him, I was cooking everything he ate. I made him fancy stuff with fish. I made him, I, I'd make a meatloaf and I'd say, take it home with you. You know, he'd come to the house for dinner. I'd make a pot roast, take it home with you. And, and I was eating. That was the time I went off and I was eating a little differently for about almost three years, two and a half years. And I had gained 22 pounds. And when I went to my doctor, my cholesterol and blood pressure was high from just that short period of time of going back to eating that way. So my doctor gave me two prescriptions for my cholesterol and my blood pressure. And I went home and I went, oh my God, no, I'm going in the direction my family went. I got online and I'm searching and all it kept coming up, raw foods, raw food. And I went, I can't do that. I love to cook. I can't live on salads and you know, and celery and carrot sticks and, you know, crudite, it's like not going to happen. But then I said, well, it seems like I should try it. So I called my daughter, Mia. I said, hey, I'm going to do this thing. You want to reach it? Yeah, let's do it. So we both went on this raw diet for two weeks. And two weeks, I said, that's it. I'm eating this way forever. And that is, then I, then it was very early on for me in that field. I couldn't find recipes online that I liked. I tried things. They weren't good. So then I started making my own recipes up because I'm a really good cook. And then that's how it led to my first book because people would say, oh, I post recipes. They go, oh, why don't you write a book? And so, you know, I, I didn't measure anything. So I had to go back in and measure all the things I was making. So then I went back to eating that way. And I said to him, I can't cook meat for you anymore. And he said, that's fine with me. I love vegetables. That was it. He was so easy with that. He didn't care. So he says, as long as it's good, I'm in. And then he just, 
you know, it was an easy transition for him. It wasn't anything. He gave up meat and chicken and all of that. He didn't care. It wasn't, it wasn't a miss for him. He said he liked vegetables anyway. So there I was. Now, I didn't fill those prescriptions, but I did go back to my doctor in six months for a checkup. And he said, oh, your blood pressure and your cholesterol are normal. The medicine is working. And I said, I never took, I never filled the prescription. And he said, what? And he said, what did you do? And I said, I changed my diet. Why don't you tell people? And he said, listen, I tell people that, but they don't do it. And my job is to keep people alive. So they would rather take the medication than to change their diet. And he said, that's why I do that. He said, not everybody would do what you did. So I never took any, I didn't ripped up that prescription. I never took it, either one of those. And that changed me from then on. I knew when I brought down my blood pressure and cholesterol, I knew I was on the right path. That really showed me six months into this that I was doing something that was better. And my family, cancer, Parkinson's, diabetes, lupus, you know, I don't know what else, everything else, a lot of strokes. My mother lived to be a nice old age, but I've lost sisters, siblings, and my dad, everybody pretty early. And, um, and you know, they were all on the medication, a lot of medication, and I avoided that. So if you want to talk about genes, I can say that, you know, biologists say it's your cells that determine how long and well you live. And your cells are changing over all the time. So if you keep a good diet and your cells are changing, they'll replicate themselves the way they are. And if you're not keeping a good diet, they'll replicate themselves that way. So you're breaking down. As you get older, that's what mostly happens. Your cells start changing and losing their vitality and you lose cells and you have less cells and those cells aren't as strong. The idea is to keep them strong. So I just talk to them and thank them all the time. and <laughs> Tell them I know they're in there working hard for me and uh, they let me know that they're gonna take care of me. So. <laughs> I love that biology of belief by Bruce Lipton. Oh, by Bruce Lipton. That's a great book. Great book. And he also has a, a YouTube, a couple of YouTube videos out that are so great. If you just want to see what he talks about, about your cells, I think it's good for everyone to know what's going on inside our body, not just what this is going on outside, but he talks about cells and this is a biologist belief now that it's biology is it. Our cells are the thing. So watch it. Look at his videos and he's, He's, it's pretty awesome. It makes sense. It really makes sense. Since the cells are turning over every five months, every six months, every five minutes, different cells have different jobs in your body and they're turning over all the time. And so it, it is true that your cells have a lot to do with your longevity and your health. So pay attention to your cells. Let them know you know they're there. Yeah. <laughs> Give them a thank I love you. That. Give them a thank you and a little gratitude every once in a while. I love that story. I've heard it from other people where the doctor said, oh, the meds must be working. Well, I never took them. You know, it, it, I mean, when I look at you, how beautiful you look and not on any meds and so healthy and vibrant. And I think nobody in my family ever made it to your age. Oh, no, really? Yeah. What, what did they make it to your age? <laughs> well, uh, actually, my brother didn't. And it makes me just so sad because wow. I know we're not we can't force them. But when you think that they're digging their grave with their knife and fork, it's just sad. Yeah. Right. It's really, it's really hard when you see that happening with people, but I really know, I always say you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. I mean, I really feel that with a lot of people, they know, you know, that if you eat a bag of potato chips, it's not going to be good for you. You know, you know, these things and yet you still do them. And so it, it, I think it's addiction. I think these foods it is. are addictive. The no, no, it, it, it is. There was a, a, a 60 minute thing where Maurice, Maurice Safer was out in a field with these, um, scientists that were trying to get flavors of orange and stuff so they can make everything fake, you know, and not have to spend as much money on the real product. And he said something about your food, you make it so it's addictive. And he said, oh yes, we make it so it's addictive. And then they come back and buy more. He said that on TV on 60 Minutes, the, the scientist said that. And then he takes you back to the lab and they have drawers and drawers and drawers of all these fake chicken flavors and this flavor. By the way, if you look at a box of cereal, It'll say blueberry cereal. There's no real blueberries in it. And they fortify all the vitamins. Fortified vitamins, your body doesn't know what that is. It stores itself as fat. You thinking you're getting those vitamins, fortified. Forget it if it says fortified, it's not real. You need to not do that. You can make a seed breakfast in, in my book, um, in my book, uh, Raw Vitalized. It shows you, you can use hemp seeds and, and black seeds and all the seed things and make a cereal out of that with just fresh fruit on it. And uh, 
you know, I mean, you don't have to be buying all this processed food. There's nothing, there's no energy in it. There's no nutrients in it. It's dead. It's been processed. They've taken out all the energy. So if you can get more used to eating fresh foods, that would be my recommendation. Go to the produce department and get fresh foods and try to make everything you can fresh. I know some people don't like to cook, but that's why this book, that's why that one book I think is so good because you know, you, you don't have that much cooking. It's just preparing things ahead of time. My daughter who eats like I do every Sunday, she makes breakfast and lunch for the week because she's the executive director of a preschool. She makes breakfast and lunch and she has that for the week and then she'll come home and they cook dinner together. But that is all salads, raw lunches, zucchini pastas, whatever. And then she puts stuff in a jar and brings that to work and turns the jar over in a bowl. That's her lunch. And then she has all these amazing breakfasts that are in the jar in the refrigerator for the week. So there is a way to do it. If you feel like you love yourself enough to take care of yourself, there is a way to do it. So can you tell us what you eat in a day on a, on a daily basis? Well, every time ask that question, it's a really hard thing because I eat when I'm hungry. I'm not a person who eats breakfast, lunch, and dinner all the time. If I have a juice, then sometimes I'm a little hungry later and I'll grab you know, maybe some fruit or something. Um, yeah, I, it's hard for me to say, but I eat things from my book most of the time. I eat a lot of salads. I try to juice most of the time. I tell you, when I stop juicing for a week or so, I feel it. So now I know I can't go without juicing. It, it makes a big difference, a day or two maybe, but I can't go without juicing because it, I feel like it energizes me completely. I walk five days a week and I walk four to five miles each time. And I walk five days a week. I have never liked exercise, but this is what you need to do. Whatever you choose, you gotta do something and be consistent. If you walk an hour every day, that's good. Two hours is better, but you've got you to take care of yourself like that. And I don't know what to say. I just eat, you know, sometimes a, a sweet potato that I bake, sometimes an artichoke. I don't know. I eat healthy foods and real foods and live foods. Sometimes I sit with a big bowl of crudite with some dressing that I make on it. I love salads. And I make all different kinds of salads. And, I, and with, with my cooked food is the same way. If I make a gluten-free pasta, you know, I'll put a lot of vegetables on it. So I don't know what to say about that because I'm so irregular. And I do eat, my weight stays the same. I'm sure it's because I walk every day. But I eat, I eat, um, I try, I don't like to eat when I first get up. But then right after that, I get hungry. So then I'll eat that. And then I, then it's too, it's a little later in the day. So then we eat dinner very early, 4.35. And then I don't like to eat any later than that before I go to bed because I like to do that, that intermittent fasting. And then I don't eat till later in the day. It's just my body is telling me to eat that way. Everybody's different. Mm -hmm. But try to eat fresh and eat not processed foods. That's the thing I can recommend. That's the key. I always say to people, whether you eat animal products or not, nobody yeah. needs to be eating processed food. Yeah, I think that's the key. And the shelves are full of them. Most of the market is filled up with processed food. And if you actually read labels, you might not want to eat it. That's why I say everybody knows what's good and not good. This It's on the label. You know, if you took the processed food out of grocery stores, they would basically just have the produce aisle. Yeah. When I grew up, there was, a, there was a grocery store, but it was small. And the produce department was big. I used to, when I was in Hollywood, we used to go to a place called the Farmer's Market was on, you know, close to Hollywood Boulevard somewhere. I forgot the street, but I remember there was a little section and there was like one kind of ketchup and, you know, some soups or something. Didn't have as many choices. Now it's two sides of the aisle or cereal. It's like, who needs that? <laughs> and then there's the produce department is like small and the other part is huge. So now we have too many choices <clears throat> and most of it's not good. So just try to stick over there in the fresh department and buy yourself some nice lettuce and spinach and cucumbers and tomatoes and make yourself different dressings so you have some choice and all of that. So yeah. anyway. How, how important is sleep? Sleep? Oh, very important. I don't know if you remember Betty White saying, she said, everybody needs eight hours of beauty sleep a night and nine if you're ugly. <laughs> Oh my God, that's hilarious. Isn't that hilarious? Yeah. Oh, oh you my say God. that. I was always one of my favorite lines of hers. Yeah. Yeah. I, you need sleep. Your body repairs. You, you need sleep. And if you can't sleep, you have to figure out how to do it. And, and I mean, I hit the pillow and I'm gone. I love to sleep. So 
So I tell myself, oh God, I can't wait to go to sleep. And I'm out like that. And I might get up and go to the bathroom once a night, but otherwise I'm a pretty good sleeper. Very rarely do I not sleep well. So yeah. I think it's important. It to, really sounds like you figured out the, the secret to longevity, the fall well, of youth. I mean, you're really a role model for this. If, if, if you, you get smarter, really, in a lot of ways, you just get smarter. Things don't bother you the same way. You get to be more, you know, say what you want and do what you want and just say, I'm going to do all the things I love to do. I'm going to have a good time. We never know how much time we have here on this earth. It could be a week. It could be 10 years. It could be 20. It could be anything, but live like it's now live like this is your day. What do you want to do? What's going to make you laugh and have fun? You know, that's what you should be doing every day. What do you love to do? Do it. You might have to do a lot of things you don't like to do, but do, do things you like to do as well. Add that in. And if you're lucky, you could make your whole day what you want it to be, like I'm doing. <laughs> How can we buy your in. paintings? Can we buy your paintings and where do we see them? Yes, Mimi Kirk Dash Art. Mimi Kirk Dash Art on Instagram. And I post, there are a lot of paintings on there. Some are sold, some are not. I post new ones. I'm getting ready for show. I also do commissions. I'm really good at finding out what people want, what size they like, what colors they like. I've been really lucky. I've done a ton of commissions and everybody's so happy with them. So I like to know a size, a color, um, but I have a lot of different works on my, on my site, my Mimi Kirk. And then I have two, two Instagrams. One is Young on Raw Food, Mimi, Mimi Kirk, Young on Raw Food, and then Mimi Kirk underscore art. So I have two, uh, two pages. One I talk mostly about food and the other I post a lot of art things. And um, I have a show coming up in San Diego where I live at the Bernardo Winery in October. You can look up the Bernardo Winery, it's the craft fair. I've not done an outdoor show. I've done one showing in Malibu and sold a ton of paintings. So I'm looking forward to this next show. And I just love it so much. I'm enjoying it so much. And my whole family, of course, wants all my paintings. I give them whatever they want, make things for them. And, you know, they're so happy that they can have my work hanging up. And I feel so good. They're going to have that forever. That <laughs> I mean, fantastic. Do you, do, you have, do you have any pets? Because I feel like pets contribute to our well-being. And it life. does. But right now I stopped having pets when, well, first of all, I can't stand losing any pet. It's too traumatic for me. But when we started to travel, my boyfriend and I, and I was flying to countries and living in Majorca, we decided we couldn't have any pets. We, I, I had a really busy schedule. I have grand dogs and grand cats, but no, we don't have any ourselves. But I stop when I'm doing my walk, I say hello to every dog <laughs> that I pass and, and pet them if they let me. And, you know, but I don't have any at home, no. But I love them. I love the animals. I, love yeah, I, I agree that losing a pet is the hardest thing, but I think living life without them are, is even- Yes, easier. I agree. I think it's really fulfilling, but just right now, we, no. we don't have any and I get to see my grand dogs and grand cats every once in a while but honestly where I live I see you know 20 dogs a day <laughs> and get to give them love and my neighbors have dogs and stuff so nice. Nice. yeah how yeah. Do you, Cindy wants to know how you feel about colonoscopies and I would add just about routine medical things like mammograms are you for those or for well, individual I mammograms. I haven't done mammograms for a long time but I do get a checkup every year blood tests I get checked every year. I'm due for one at the end of the month. We'll see what it did. I did the blood test. Now we'll see what happens when I get there. No, you have to go to, go to your doctor. You have to go to your eye doctor. You have to go to your dentist. You have to get a colonoscopy. Um, you know, you have to do certain things. You just do it and don't even think about it. You can't just guess. I know a lot of vegans who think, oh, my immune system is perfect. I don't have to do anything. I disagree. I think you need to go check. Do you need more D? Do you need more B? You know. You, you've got to check. Big deal. Just go to the doctor. You don't have to do what they say. But you know. <laughs> I love that. Go to the doctor. But I love that. That great you line. Yeah, you don't have to, like, they'll tell you what it is. And then you say, okay, I'm going to go home and eat more spinach or, you know, do what you want to do, but get checked. Don't miss the dentist. Very important. Yeah, de yeah I would agree. Definitely. And don't miss the eye doctor. I just want to say I have macular degeneration. It keeps a lot of people out of the loop of anything. I, 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 have to use, I have to use this magnifying glass um, and I blow everything up on my phone. If I, at the store, I take a picture and blow it up and look at it because, you know, I, things jump around on the screen when you have macular, you look at a word and then it's, 
not there again. And it's an odd little thing. I'm painting. It doesn't stop me from doing anything. So yes, I have it. I can still see well enough. I have to get close to people to see their face, but I can see way far. I just can't make out the details of their face. So I tell my friends, if you say hi, I don't say hi back, just walk closer. So I can see you. You know, it's just accepting what's going on and not making the end of the world out of it. Do your best. We all see people who are, have um, disabilities in some way and they do awesome things, amazing things. And I think we just have to accept things and not make things dark for ourselves. Make it light, bring light into your life. So that's so cool that you still paint, you know, even yeah. with that. I can see everything I'm painting. I don't have any problem with that. And abstract is great because it's such a freeing thing. For me, it's really freeing. Right. Um, and my family's on their way over. We spent the night together here at, at the hotel on that. We had an amazing time. Everybody came in and bought food and we had so much laughs. And I changed outfits five times while everybody was here. I had flowing kimonos going and I'd say, excuse me, I'd go back and put on another outfit. They were laughing so hard. I was jewelry and did the whole thing. Five outfits I changed, you know, the last one for the cake. And then, uh, you know, we just had a great time and they're coming back right now, actually, in a few minutes to uh, enjoy the rest of the day with me. So yeah. I'm feeling very happy that I have this amazing, loving family and that, uh, you know, they have my DNA and I look around and I go, I'm living on here in some way in my family. So it's such a great feeling. Yeah. yeah. I hope I can see you in person one day. Do, do you still give talks or do any cooking demos or just we have to find well, an art show? I will, but no one's doing anything right now. You know, I was usually invited everywhere, but since COVID, things have kind of not settled in yet. So usually, usually I don't look for the work. Usually people say, can you come speak or do a demo or something? And then I'm pretty open to do that. But um, no one's really uh, come since COVID because we traveled all the time. We were always somewhere, uh, everywhere in the world, from Germany to London to Rome to I don't know where. But and we lived in Mallorca for six months out of the year, three months at a time. And then we would go and do all our traveling from there, but nobody seems to be doing much. They don't want to take a chance to do some, throw a big event. And, and then, you know, because we're still dealing with COVID and now they're talking about the flu. So people are not as open to travel everywhere. I mean, concerts still, are still happening and something, but I don't see much of all this other right. stuff. Yeah. So. People are asking about your fabulous hair and if you have any beauty tips as far as products. Um, I don't, I'm letting my hair go gray, as you can see. <laughs> I was blonde for, I don't know, since I, I liked the gray at first and I didn't like it, but since COVID I've been letting it grow out. Um, I, here's the only thing I think is a really good hint is that when you brush your hair, a nice round brush, not a metal one, you scrape your scalp a little and then you brush it all the way to the ends. You need to get your natural oil from your scalp into the rest of your hair. Conditioning doesn't do the same thing. You need to use your own oils and just brush and scrape it and brush it into the end and rub the brush and then scrape those oils into the end. And you know, don't wash your hair every day. Leave a few days in between and get that oil into your hair. And I think it helps. And that's about it. I don't have any other hair secrets. <laughs> Right. Well, Mimi, you are just a delight. It's been so fun spending this time with you on the day after your 84th birthday. Thank you so much. And I'm so happy that you asked me to join you because I've known about you for a long time. And I know you've interviewed just about everybody. And I thought, well, one day she's going to want to interview me. And now it's been <laughs> and I want to interview you <laughs> maybe every year on your birthday, sure. you can come back and share your words of wisdom and maybe even show us your art sometime when, when you're at your home. That. that would be fun. Well, That'd thank you so great. much for having me. I'm so happy. Oh, yeah, this was just delightful. Thank you, Mimi. Yeah. Everybody thank had a great time spending the, this hour thank with you. I had a great time with you. Thanks Thank so much. you. Bye -bye. And thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back tomorrow as we conclude Longevity Week on Chef AJ Live with two more octogenarians, Anne and Caldwell B. Estelson Jr. Take care, everyone.